Just as in the churchyard with Miles, the whole thing was upon us. Much as I had made of the fact that this name had never once between us been sounded, the quick smitten stare with which the child's face now received it fairly likened my breach of the silence to the smash of a plane of glass. It added to the interposing cry, as if to stay the blow, that Mrs. Gross at the same instant uttered over my violence, the shriek of a creature scared, or rather wounded, which, in turn, within a few seconds, was completed by a gasp of my own. I seized my colleague's arm. She's there, she's there. Miss Jessel stood before us on the opposite bank exactly as she had stood the other time, and I remember strangely, as if as the first feeling now produced in me, my thrill of joy at having brought on a proof. She was there, so I was justified. She was there, so I was neither cruel nor mad. She was there for poor scared Mrs. Gross, but she was there most for Flora, and no moment of my monstrous time was perhaps so extraordinary as that in which I consciously threw out to her, with the sense that, pale and ravenous demon as she was, she would catch and understand it, an inarticulate message of gratitude. She rose erect on the spot my friend and I had lately quitted, and there wasn't it, there wasn't in all the long reach of her desire an inch of her evil that fell short. This first vividness of vision and emotion were things of a few seconds, during which Mrs. Gross, Gross's dazed blank across to where I pointed, struck me as showing that she too at last saw, just as it carried my own eyes precipitate, precipitately to the child. The revelation, then, of the manner in which Flora was affected startled me in truth far more than it would have done to find her also merely agitated, for direct dismay was of course not what I had expected. Prepared and on her guard, as our pursuit had actually made her, she would repress every betrayal, and I was therefore at once shaken by my first glimpse of the particular one for which I had not allowed. To see her, without a convulsion of her small pink face, not even feign to glance in the direction of the prodigy I announced, but only, instead of that, turn at me an expression of hard, still gravity, an expression absolutely new and unprecedented, and that appeared to read and accuse and judge me. This was a stroke that somehow converted the little girl herself into a figure portentous. I gaped at her coolness, even though my certitude of her thoroughly seeing was never greater than at that instant and then in the immediate need to defend myself i called her passionately to witness she's there you little unhappy thing there 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 and you know it as well as you know me i had said shortly before to mrs gross that she was not at these times a child but an old old woman and my description of her couldn't have been more strikingly confirmed that in the way in which for all notice of this, she simply showed me, without an expressional concession or admission, a countenance of deeper and deeper, of indeed suddenly quite fixed reprobation. I was by this time, if I can put the whole thing at all together, more appalled at what I may properly call her manner that at an, than at anything else, though it was quite simultaneously that I became aware of having Mrs. Gross also, and very formidably, to reckon with. My elder companion, the next moment at any rate, blotted out everything but her own flushed face and her loud shocked protest, a burst of high disapproval. What a dreadful turn to be sure, miss! Where on earth do you see anything? I could only grasp her more quickly yet, for even while she spoke, the hideous plain presence stood undimmed and undaunted. It had already lasted a minute, and it lasted while I continued, seizing my colleague, quite thrusting her at it and presenting her to it, to insist with my pointing hand. You don't see her exactly as we see? You mean to say you don't now? Now? She's as big as a blazing fire. Only look, dearest woman, look. She looked, just as I did, and gave me, with her deep groan of negation, repulsion, compassion, the mixture with her pity of her relief at her exemption, a sense, touching to me even then, that she would have backed me up, up if she had been able. 
I might well have needed that, for with this hard blow of the proof that her eyes were hopelessly sealed, I felt my own situation horribly crumble. I felt, I saw, my livid predecessor press from her position on my defeat, and I took the measure, more than all, of what I should have from this instant to deal with in the astounding little attitude of Flora. Into this attitude Mrs. Gross immediately and violently entered, breaking, even while there pierced through my sense of ruin, a prodigious tri private triumph, into breathless reassurance. She isn't there, little lady, nobody's there, and nobody's there, and you never see nothing, my sweet. How can poor Miss Jessel, when poor Miss Jessel's dead and buried? We know, don't we, love? And she appealed, blundering in, to the child. It's all a mere mistake and a worry and a joke, and we'll go home as fast as we can. Our companion on this had responded with a strange, quick primness of propriety, and they were again, with Mrs. Gross on her feet, united, as it were, in shocked opposition to me. Flora continued to fix me with her small mask of disaffection, and even at that minute I prayed God to forgive me for seeming to see that, as she stood there holding tight to our friend's dress, her incomparable childish beauty had suddenly failed, had quite vanished. I've said it already, she was literally, she was hideously hard. She had turned common and almost ugly. I don't know what you mean. I see nobody. I see nothing. I never have. I think you're cruel. I don't like you. Then, after this deliverance, which might have been that of a vulgarly pert little girl in the street, she hugged Mrs. Gross most, more closely and buried in her skirts the dreadful little face. In this position, she launched an almost furious wail. Take me away! Take me away! Oh, take me away from her! From me? I panted. From you! From you! She cried. Even Mrs. Gross looked across at me dismayed. While well, I had nothing to do but communicate again with the figure that on the opposing on the opposite bank, without a movement as rigidly still as if catching beyond the interval, our voices was as vividly there for my disaster as it was not there for my service. The wretched child had spoken exactly as if she had got from some outside source each of her stabbing little words, and I could therefore, in the full despair of all I had to accept, but sadly, but sadly shake my head at her. If I had ever doubted, all my doubt would be at present have gone. I've been living with the miserable truth, and now it has only too much closed round me. Of course I've lost you. I've interfered, and you've seen, under her dictation, with which I faced over the pool again our infernal witness, the easy and perfect way to meet it. I've done my best, but I've lost you. Goodbye. For Mrs. Gross, I had an imperative, an almost frantic, go, go, before which, in infinite distress, but mutely possessed of the little girl, and clearly convinced, in spite of her blindness, that something awful had occurred, and some collapse engulfed us, she retreated by the way we had come as fast as she could move. Of what first happened when I was left alone, I had no subsequent memory. I only knew that at the end of, I suppose, a quarter of an hour, an odorous dampness and roughness, chilling and, and piercing my trouble, had made me understand that I must have thrown myself on my face to the ground and given way to a wildness of grief. I must have lain there long and cried and wailed, for when I raised my head the day was almost done. I got up and looked a moment through the twilight at the grey pool and its blank haunted edge, and then I looked back to the house my dreary and difficult course. When I, and then I took back to the house my dreary and difficult course. When I reached the gate in the fence, the boat, to my surprise, was gone, so that I had a fresh reflection to make on Flora's extraordinary command of the situation. She passed that night, by the most tacit and, I should add, were not the words so dr grotesque a false note, the happiest of arrangements with Mrs. Gl Gross. As I saw neither of them on my return, but on the other hand, I saw, as by an ambiguous compensation, a great deal of miles. I saw, I can use no other phrase, so much of him that it fairly measured more than it had ever measured. No evening I had passed at Bly was to have had the portentous quality of this one. 
in spite of which, and in spite also of the deeper depths of consternation that had opened beneath my feet, there was literally in the ebbing actual an extraordinarily sweet sadness. On reaching the house, I had never so much as looked for the boy. I had simply gone straight to my room to change what I was wearing and to take in, at a glance, much material testimony to Flora's rupture. Her little belongings had all been removed. When later, by the schoolroom fire, I was served with tea by the usual maid, I indulged on the article of my other pupil in no inquiry whatsoever. He had his freedom now. He might have it to the end. Well, he did have it, and it consisted, in part at least, of his coming in at about eight o'clock and sitting down with me in silence. On the removal of the tea things, I had blown out the candles and drawn my chair closer. I was conscious of a mortal coldness and felt as if I should never again be warm. So when he appeared, I was sitting in the glow with my thoughts. He paused a moment by the door as if to look at me, then, as if to share them, came to the other side of the hearth and sank into a chair. We sat there in absolute stillness, yet he wanted, I felt, to be with me.